Hi, welcome. This is Dr. Brian Adnoff. I'm president of DFCR. Uh, and welcome to the DFCR Parabola Center webinar on Biden's cannabis pardon and call for rescheduling. Where do we go from here? So as I mentioned, I'm president of DFCR. Uh, just a little background for those of you who don't know about us. We were started in 2015 by David Nathan. Um, he's our founder and he was impressed even as late as 2015, seven years ago, eight years ago now. Um, how many physicians, organizations said nothing about cannabis or were against both adult use and medical cannabis, but so many of his colleagues, you know, kind of on the down low said, hey, I'm okay with this. So he wrote a Washington op-ed piece about it and he got wonderful feedback about it. So he started DFCR. Um, I came in at kind of late. I was a founding member, but I was working full time as a distinguished professor of alcohol and drug abuse at University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. And um, I worked for the state of Texas, the university, and I worked with the VA doc for some 30 years. Uh, so I couldn't be really too outspoken about it. Um, I imagine the physicians out there know where I'm coming from. Uh, I retired from full-time academia about four years ago and offered to join the board of DFCR. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm president of it, which has been uh, a joy and an honor. Um, and I hope the rest of you join. So uh, we're really excited to be doing this webinar with Parabola Center and uh, their wonderful partners, wonderful organization. I'd like to give a couple minutes to Shalene Title, uh, who you'll hear from later as a speaker, but I just wanted her to introduce, uh, she's the founder and CEO of Parabola Center, and I wanted to introduce uh, her to introduce you to the Parabola Center. So Shalene? Thank you. Thank you so much. So Parabola Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank. And our mission is to provide everyone with the education, access, and expertise to support cannabis legalization policies that put people and small businesses first. And if you follow us, what you'll notice about us is that we are um, a little different because we're free of that big corporate influence. And I'm really glad to be partnering with DFCR on this webinar. I've had the pleasure of working with DFCR on different coalitions and committees. And I'll give the highest compliment, which is that I feel what DFCR is for doctors is somewhat similar to what we are um, for lawyers in that I think both organizations have a vision and are very proactive about listening as well as presenting that vision. And I hope inspiring people to fight for your own vision as well. So thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks to all of you. It's really great to be able to introduce our audiences to each other. Thank you, Shalene. Um, we are the only organization I know of, of physicians who uh, promote and support the legalization and evidence-based regulation of cannabis through testimony, uh, regulation, and education. Uh, I really appreciate the contributions of our speakers and the efforts of Janelle Bechdahl DeAndre Wright, and of course, our DFCR operation manager, Lisa Capitini, um, to make, uh, they've done an awesome job um, getting us prepared for this webinar, and I'm sure it will be a wonderful success. Uh, let me introduce Farrah Blake. Uh, while we often hear about the devastating consequences of the drug war, for many of us, these consequences, like myself, these consequences are an abstract concept and, and have not affected us directly. Uh, Fair is here to help us remember that the damage of the drug war, including cannabis prohibition, is very, very real. But we can see by her transformation, there is hope. I was introduced to Fair about a year ago, and I've been impressed with her passion for all things cannabis, her drive, her eclectic skill set and her desire to do good. Fresh out of high school, her college career 
college and career path came to a halt following arrest and conviction related to cannabis. She since had a successful career as a model, more recently as a social media community manager for several cannabis related businesses. And she just received a Just, just Leadership USA Leading with Conviction Fellowship. Um, and we will hear about the intersection of trauma and her cannabis conviction, her medical cannabis use, and her motherhood. Vera, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you for having me. And this is an amazing um, opportunity. A little nervous, if I could be honest, because this is actually going to be my first time speaking, um, actually, about my arrest. I remember when Dr. Bryan actually emailed me about this opportunity. And it's one thing to actually, you know, speak about your cannabis usage and your advocacy. Um, but when you have to speak about certain traumas that it has happened in your life, it that becomes like a little bit of a hurdle, but it's definitely a necessary conversation. And I'm just really happy to be here. Um, so I guess I can just start by story telling my story. Um, so in 2008, I was on my first day, you know, fresh out of high school. Um, and I basically it was just supposed to be simple dinner and a movie and then come home but it did not happen or go as planned. Um, at the time I was a, like just a social cannabis um, user. I really um, didn't like drinking or alcohol. Um, it just wasn't for me. And cannabis actually really helped me um, really early on. Um, I would say as far as like just anxiety and just kind of managing my mania and um, depression. Um, so yeah, so on our way to the movie theaters, um, you know, we saw the classic Harold and Kumar Escape Guantanamo Bay, and to be transparent, we did smoke before the movie. Um, so yeah, after the movie, we were on our way home, and we noticed that a cop was actually like following us for about like three to five minutes or so. Um, I was just automatically nervous because I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I just, you know, just a natural fear of being just a black young woman. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just kind of did something illegal. You don't want to get in trouble because, you know, I rather get in trouble with my mom before any authority figure. Um, so I want to say about 10 minutes of the officer following us, we got pulled over. Um, we didn't actually know for what, um, because, you know, the car was intact, um, you know, license registration was fine. So we were pulled over um, by the officer and, you know, it was just a classic license and registration. Um, my friend who was the driver provided license, registration, um, insurance, I believe. And, when uh, my friend asked, why did you pull us over? We didn't really get an answer. It was just, um, put your hands on the, uh, turn off the car, put your hands on the dashboard, don't move. And I, that's, at that point, I was like panicking, like immediately, because before this incident, the only trouble I think I've been in in high school was I organized a walkout our junior year, um, our principal, had just said something just really ignorant and just blatantly racist about um, the student body and had offended pretty much every black student <laughs> um, in the school. And me being on student council, I wanted to kind of host the dialogue. The principal didn't want to hear it, so I organized a walkout. And after that, um, the only trouble I've been in is probably with my parents because I lied my senior year to kind of sneak off and do a, um, to go to a Beyonce concert. So having my hands on the dashboard and, you know, another cop kind of like exiting the car, um, I just started to panic immediately. I just, I, I didn't want to become a hashtag. I didn't want to get shot. I didn't know like what the procedure was and I was just really nervous. Um, so the officer came back to the car told us to get out of the car um, because he smelled cannabis. 
So I get out of the car um, first and I just stand like just next to the car and the officer kind of like snatched me and then kind of like shoved me to like um, shoved me to sit down. And I, I just, I didn't know what to think or what to do. I just did not, you know, I didn't want any trouble. I wanted to live. <laughs> um, I'm trying to just like survive an interaction. And the only trouble that I know that I brought is just that I consumed cannabis, you know, before, um, you know, before this interaction. So um, they searched uh, the officer, uh, one of the officers searched the car, another um, officer has their gun at this point uh, pointed towards the both of us just to t tell us to kind of like sit our hands, um, um, to sit our hands, um, I'm sorry, to sit underneath our hands. And I just started crying. I just, just didn't know what to do. The officers kept shouting to like, be quiet. And next thing you know, they find cannabis in the car um, that belonged to the driver, my friend. After that, we um, were arrested. We were um, processed. And I think I lied to my mom saying that we experienced car trouble because I didn't, I didn't know how to tell her that her daughter just got arrested for cannabis and that she has a court date and everything. Um, eventually, like all parents, she found out and was panicking because, you know, your daughter's, your, <laughs> your only daughter is in trouble right now. So we went to um, my different lawyers just to see, like, do I need legal resident, uh, resident, uh, representation? Um, and pretty much two lawyers that we went to said no, because it was just my first offense. Um, you know, the amount like couldn't be like, you know, that, um, I couldn't cause that much harm. So it was just like, don't worry about it. Um, when I met with the prosecutor, that was my first time just in any type of legal trouble. So he basically kind of persuaded saying that one person has to take the fall. Um, long story short, I took the fall. Um, so in my court date in front of the judge, um, what I was told that I would be charged with was just possession of marijuana. It's just, you know, a first offense. Um, you know, you'll probably get community service or community um, conditional discharge. And it just didn't work out that way. Um, when I got in front of the judge, it was um, possession of marijuana with the intent to distribute in a school zone. So instead of facing the community service and just the slap on the wrist, I am now either facing three years in jail or I had to pay $1,700 fine and I had to do conditional discharge up to six months. Um, and I just panicked immediately. Like luckily, um, just really luckily, I was working um, just like right out of high school. I you know, had a retail job as a full-time student um, and I was saving money to go to a trip, uh, my first trip abroad with my friends um, to Paris. And literally I like worked so hard. Um, I worked so hard for that trip and I didn't get to go because, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get to go because I had to pay for this mistake. Um, I'm sorry. Um, And I think I'm just like emotional because we know of so many stories where um, African Americans, you know, any party of color facing any type of legal battle, um, money is the reason, you know, why we are not seen as innocent. Um, I know so many people who were in my position who didn't have the money and now they're locked in a cage. Um, just for consuming a plant or possessing a plant. Um, and just something as minor as not even trying to distribute it, but because a cop smelled it or you, you know, got searched and there's a joint in your pocket. So um, yeah, it um, affected me um, a lot. Um, luckily, like I said, I was able to pay it. Um, when I 
went to my first um, meeting with uh, conditional discharge, it was literally just they mouth swabbed me. Um, I tested negative for marijuana or any, I don't know, drug that they were testing for. And I didn't have to go back again because I already paid my fine. Um, when it came to me and just trying to study and be present in school, I just, I couldn't. I couldn't stop thinking of, well, what if I didn't have the money or why is a cop allowed you to, why is a cop allowed to remove you from a vehicle so aggressively because they just find a plant? Um, I still don't understand it till this, till this day, but that's why we're here. <laughs> um, my family's really big on therapy. Um, I was diagnosed bipolar when I was like 13 and talk therapy really um, changed the tra trajectory of my mental health because I had, you know, somebody I'm biased to kind of talk to and flesh out my feelings. Um, when it came to this matter and going to therapy, um, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and I think, you know, just being 18, coming out of college, you're just like, PTSD that only happens to like veterans or sexual assault victims. I didn't think that a police interaction could cause this, but you know, looking back on it, like, yeah, seeing a fire on for your first time, being in that position and just kind of like not knowing what to do. And you're feeling guilty because I felt like I brought so much shame to my family. I was embarrassed. Um, I didn't really tell my, like my, didn't really tell my girlfriends about it um, until like my court date came. And I just, I, I lost the love for education just in that moment. Um, my major was um, anatomy and physiology. And I just fell out of love with it. Just, just like that. I love science just, and I was just like, you know what? I can't focus. My my grades are failing. I'm paying for school now, um, just out of pocket, and I just it's just it's just too much um, for me. And um, I just want to say that now I'm I'm proud that I can I can speak. I'm proud that I've had different had the pleasure and opportunity of having different, working with different platforms. I'm here with Brown Box, um, you know, we're female, black owned, and I get the opportunity to talk to so many mothers. I get to talk to so many people who have been directly harmed by the war on drugs. And with me kind of being a digital activist, I like to say with Buy Weed From Women and Etain and just different collectives um, of small businesses and um, dispensaries that I'm happy that my voice and my experiences can be rehabilitation for somebody who was just like me. So I really, again, thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Oh, well, Farah, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you. That was very powerful and um, something I needed to hear um, to remind me. And yeah, not something I've had to experience. And uh, thank you for sharing it. Our, our next speaker, uh, Shalene Title, who you met at the beginning, uh, is an Indian American attorney and longtime drug policy activist who has been writing, passing, and implementing equitable cannabis laws for over 20 years and she's the author of Fair and Square, How to Effectively Incorporate Social Equity in the Cannabis Laws and Regulations. In 2017, Shalene was appointed by the Massachusetts governor to serve as one of five inaugural commissioners of the Cannabis Control Commission, the agency tasked with regulating legal and medical marijuana in, Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth. Described as the people's weed watchdog in Boston Magazine's 2019 Power List, Great title for Shaleen. She was widely recognized during her term for her focus on racial justice and her efforts to make cannabis industry more fair and inclusive. 
Uh, and that's how I came to know of Shalene through her work in this area. Uh, she's really very well known for this. Um, she's, she's the person uh, to go to. She currently serves as a distinguished cannabis policy practitioner in residence at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law's Drug and Enforcement Policy Center and as vice chair of the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition. Um, she's founding mem board member of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. She's a frequent keynote speaker and consultant on cannabis policy and has testified before government bodies around the world about restorative justice and marijuana laws. And in 2021 was an honoree on the Boston Business Journal's 440, 40, under 40 list. Um, it's such a pleasure to have Shalane here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, um, for the very warm introduction. I want, really want to thank you, Farah, um, for sharing your story um, and having the courage and the boldness to do something that was uncomfortable for you so that you can make sure it doesn't happen to other people and for all of your work to make sure that it doesn't happen for other people. I think that, you know, you and I could have shared half an hour's worth of charts and graphs. Uh, to make the point, but nothing would have made the point as well as you did with so many of us, I think, thinking about how we went to see Harold and Kumar um, and were definitely high and, you know, <laughs> what happened to us. Um, what if we had gotten pulled over, you know, that just makes the point better than than the charts. So I really appreciate you. And I really appreciate um, DFCR for putting together a panel with the people that I want to listen to when we think about what's next and what better legalization should look like. I want to listen to Farah. I want to listen to small business owners like Micah. I want to listen to public health experts like Kevin. This is what um, matters, I think, not what big corporations want. And so being able to talk about where we are and what's, uh, what's next uh, is a really great opportunity. Um, I will share my slides at this point. Okay, can someone give me a thumbs up so you can see them? Okay, excellent. So um, as I mentioned, Parabola Center is a nonprofit think tank. Um, we really want to give everyone the opportunity to be a part of the conversation about what federal legalization should look like. So we're not just being reactive on a day to day basis, but also that you're really pushing for what cannabis will look like at the national level, because we have the opportunity to shape it now. So starting with record clearance. Um, Again, Sarah's point made it very clear. It's just the most important thing that we need to do. When prohibition has been in place um, and we've had generations of people impacted by it, we need to clear their records. We need to let people out of prison. We need to have mass pardons and automatic expungement. And it doesn't need to be a sweetener um, for some corporate uh, legalization bill, which is what we often see, but rather the most urgent and important thing that we do. In my experience, um, it's actually not the underlying goal, but rather the technicalities and logistics of especially expungement bills that makes it difficult. And so the most important thing is to make sure that jurisdictions have guidance and technical support to make sure um, that they're clean, clearing records. And the other most important thing is that we are making, we are facilitating it smoothly so that the person doesn't have to do anything. So what makes a bad expungement law, like what we have in Massachusetts, unfortunately, is that um, people don't know that they're eligible. And if they do know they're eligible, they have to get help uh, to file a petition with a court. Um, what's much better is when you have automatic expungement or thousands of mass pardons. And the last thing I'll say about record clearance is we need to keep up the pressure to make sure that they actually happen. For example, with Biden's announcement that he is rightfully taking credit for um, several times since, we have not, in fact, seen the pardon certificates for the people who actually need it. So we need to keep that pressure up. So um, I want to talk about social equity. Um, the term comes from Oakland, the first jurisdiction to actually pass a legal cannabis framework that focused on repairing the harms of the war on drugs. 
So um, I have spent much of the last few years on social equity policy. As Brian mentioned, I wrote a publication on it. Um, in some regions, my name is synonymous with social equity. So why have I crossed it out? The reason is, even though it's the most critical part of legalization in my mind, I do my best to not use that term anymore. And it's for two reasons. One, it has done its job. You cannot pass a legalization law anywhere in the country without talking about what you're going to do for black and brown communities. And now we need to get more specific and then instead describe exactly the policy we're talking about. And that can actually be better um, for support. There was a survey that just came out from uh, Data for Progress last week, consistent with other surveys I've seen, that showed when you ask Republicans about um, legalization laws, the majority were in favor. The majority also supported community grants as an equity policy um, when it was laid out specifically. It's actually a clear bipartisan thing. And so we need to talk about specifics, but we also need to make sure we're not letting people co-opt the term. So now that it's been around for five years, you see corporations talking about how they have social equity for business. And when I heard that term, I was just done using it. In the 90s, we used to have this phrase, when you're smoking a bowl and it's all gone, we used to call it cash. I don't know if people still use bowls or if that term's still around, but that's what I think is the case with social equity. The term is cash. We've gotten what we need out of it. Now we need to move to more specific terms, exactly what we're talking about. Or if we're talking about broader market structure, which is going to affect every single aspect of legalization, we need to talk about fairness more broadly. And that means not just social equity, but public health oriented policies, anti-monopoly policies, and helping small businesses. Um, before we move on from social equity though, I do wanna give you two quick things. Um, first of all, opponents will tell you that social equity policies are a failure and that they are unconstitutional and that it's all very complicated, but we can't have them anymore. That is not the case. Um, they're definitely not where we want them to be. But since the first ones were implemented in 2016, up until now, we've seen steady progress in the results. And there are only two places where we've seen um, successful legal challenges. So I want to describe those. The first is that you can't have a quota for minorities. So you can't say um, I'm a state and I'm putting aside 15% of licenses for minorities, which is what Ohio did and it got struck down. So we're not going to do that. And then secondly, um, you can't have residency requirements. So you can't say in my state, um, if you want to own a marijuana license, you have to live in this state. So those are the two things. Um, granted, it's a little more complicated than that. And we have um, a couple of hours worth of webinars about residency requirements um, on our website. If you have a social equity program, I recommend not having residency requirements at all. So instead of um, basing it on where you live, which is very common. Instead, base it on whether a person has a conviction or not, or if their family had a conviction. Um, but the bottom line is, those are the two places where we've seen challenges, and that's it. So don't believe it if you've heard that social equity programs are unconstitutional or we can't have them anymore. So this is a term that I like to use instead, um, one of the terms, and it's exclusivity, which means that you can only access cannabis business licenses if you're from a certain group. I like this word because people already know what it means. It's very specific. You, you understand what exclusive is and you can't co-opt it. You can't have a corporate exclusivity program. So I'll give you a couple examples. So in Massachusetts, you can only have a delivery license the first few years if you are a social equity applicant. Um, that was challenged and the lawsuit was not successful. There was also a similar, there is also a similar policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the city level where you can only have any type of cannabis business license for the first few years 
if you're a social equity applicant. That was also challenged. They accused it of being reverse racism, not successful. So both are in place. The challenges were not successful. And what I would love for you to think about is how this concept of exclusivity could be applied at the federal level. Um, this is another example. This is just from days ago in New York. Um, you can only have uh, a retail license currently if you are a nonprofit or what they call justice involved, which is similar to the concept of social equity. And others will be able to open up in time, but it's very, very different because most states started with larger corporations, whereas New York is doing the opposite. So um, this is from a op-ed I wrote last month, how to ruin cannabis legalization, put alcohol and tobacco corporations in charge was the full title. And unfortunately that was not a hypothetical. Um, it was based on a hearing that had just taken place in Congress where um, we didn't have any small businesses and we didn't have any public health experts, but we had a front group that represented big tobacco and the thing that's very silly is I don't, especially to a public health oriented audience, um, those of you with DF DFCR, I don't need to explain what's wrong with the idea of putting big tobacco in charge of what federal legalization looks like. In fact, um, the population in general surveys show are very aware of concerns with big tobacco. Um, they don't think nonprofits should take money from big tobacco um, and they have a very negative perception overall. So what they do is they create front groups and the front groups come out and say, hey, we're the new cannabis legalization experts, just listen to us. And they don't mention who they are. And that's exactly what happened at that hearing in Congress. And so what we have to do is stay vigilant of those efforts and just be transparent about it. Because as you will, will see if you read my op-ed, there's a lot of ways that legalization can go wrong if we let a few big corporations who are not involved now um, take charge of it. So we also have at Parabola Center a sign-on letter. Um, and the sign-on letter is great because it has um, watchdogs from the alcohol and tobacco industry as well. It's the first time I think we've had a, a cross section of legalization supporters and people who are questionable, quest feel questionable about legalization of cannabis all coming together and saying, please don't put these people in charge. So if you are someone with a government, nonprofit, or academic affiliation who's a drug policy expert that would like to sign on, um, it's on our website at parabolacenter.com. Get in touch and I will add you. Okay, so I talked about exclusivity. Um, the next word I wanna explain that I use instead of social equity is mandatory disqualification. And so this is a term for when a law prevents someone from being part of the cannabis industry. And most states have this for people based on um, criminal convictions. And in some cases, cannabis convictions, which makes no sense. Why would you exclude people for working in cannabis when they're going to be working in cannabis? Um, but what we did was we replaced that and said, in fact, if you are convicted racketeer, which if you don't know, big tobacco companies are convicted racketeers, they committed fraud, they lied to customers about their products, um, then you can't take place in the cannabis industry. And then the last term I want to mention is inter interstate commerce. So this describes how we will go from dozens of individual state markets to one national market. And the point I want to make about that as someone who stood up a state level market is that the decision we make here can either completely reset the national market and make it look exactly how we want it to look, not exactly, but close, or we can end up with a disaster. And I think many of us will regret legalization um, if we don't do this right. So I put these three things together. Um, this is Parabola Center's vision 
We want mandatory disqualification for tobacco companies and exclusive access to interstate commerce for small businesses. Um, but I hope you will think about what you want it to look like and you will advocate for that because we are the only generation that is going to be able to affect how federal legalization looks when it starts. It's never going to happen again. And after that, it's gonna be much harder to change. I wanna close with one last thing. We are in an unprecedented era of antitrust scrutiny, meaning that all across parties and all across legislators, um, people are very aware of the harm it causes when you put a few corporations in charge. And so just today or yesterday, there was an announcement that the Department of Justice uh, is looking at Google. Just a few days ago, it was Ticketmaster. Think about if we had a few corporations in charge of cannabis, how gross the product could be, you know, how chemical laden and addictive and nasty the product could be. And if you want to grow at home, do you want to ask a huge corporation for permission? It's really not an exaggeration that we could be headed that way if we are not careful about antitrust considerations and promoting small businesses. Um, fairness and fairness. So thank you very much for your time. And um, with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and introduce Micah. So Micah Sherman is a small business owner um, of a cannabis cultivator in Olympia, Washington. He works in the cannabis industry and he works with policymakers to revise and improve the rules and laws that shape outcomes in the industry with the goal of building an equitable small business ecosystem. I will turn it over to you, Micah. Hi, thanks, Shaleen, and uh, thanks everybody for inviting me to be here. And uh, I just wanted to start out and also thank Farah for your story. I was um, very moved by that. And, uh, you know, somebody as a teenager who did much worse things and had society bend over backwards to to try to make sure that uh, I was taken care of. Uh, you know, that's just a privilege of, of the position I'm in. And I, I hope we can, uh, you know, use that juxtaposition to realize how, um, you know, frankly, racist the war on drugs was and uh, and use that knowledge to um, do better as we build the cannabis industry. So thanks so much for that story. I think it's critical to us uh, in our work as we move forward in a national way. Um, so I uh, I run a small cannabis business in, in Washington, and I'm also involved with um, the Washington Sun and Craft Growers Association. We're a trade group that represents small farmers. Uh, we were involved in starting the um, National Craft Cannabis Coalition, which is a coalition of state-level trade groups from across the country that are, have come together to help direct national cannabis policy in a way that is uh, considerate of building that small business ecosystem that Shaleen uh, mentioned. And uh, through that work, we we have a couple of specific policies that I'll that I'll talk about in the context of of this discussion. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that I uh, I got a chance in the last couple of years to serve on our state's social equity and cannabis task force. Uh, we legalized in 2012 before uh, that term had really gotten into the into the mainstream, and it wasn't a part of our legal system here. And so and we've gone back in the last few years to try to integrate some of the uh, policies uh from across the country into into our market and expand and, and improve things in that way and so i got to be one of the licensees that worked on that and and learned quite a bit about uh about social equity and the sort of things that have and haven't worked and uh i really appreciated what Shaleen had to say on all of that and uh you know for me the most important thing on on, on social equity is that uh we build uh an economy of which markets are a component, but not the entirety of, and that there's a chance for people to exist in non-market ways uh, to, to procure, produce, and consume cannabis. Um, I think that that's a really important thing for us to keep in mind, especially in the context of medical, medical cannabis. Uh, markets work really well when all the actors are voluntary. Markets don't work particularly well when um, you're trying to procure something that you need to live your life uh healthily and feeling 
uh, you know, treating your medical conditions in a way that you need to. So I think it's really important that we keep in mind that uh, legalization is a process of of converting uh, illicit economies, which again include markets, but also include non-market production and consumption of cannabis. And uh, as we've moved further and further into a commercialized legalization framework, we've definitely lost a lot of the best parts of the non-commercial cannabis economy that existed illicitly. And I think um, you know one of the things I, I was hoping to communicate here is that we uh, in the cannabis industry uh, could benefit from the um, what I've heard called white coat privilege that doctors have in shaping uh, cannabis policy. And one of the ways that uh, I think that that could be very powerful is in ensuring that as we continue to move forward with legalization, that we keep in mind that there are uh, care economies in cannabis that have existed for generations that should be worked to be preserved in the legal cannabis mark uh, economy uh and especially in that medical component and um so as we move forward into national legalization a lot of the big questions are about how do we shape these economies who's going to be in the decision makers who's in the driver's seat for that uh process and you know so it comes to which federal agency is going to be responsible for writing a majority of the rules that shape the cannabis economy uh how is the production of cannabis going to be considered? Uh, is that an agricultural activity? It's not currently classified as an agricultural activity. And there's a lot of restrictions around that. If we move forward with national legalization without addressing that issue, we may end up in a, in a circumstance where the production of the cannabis plant is only allowed to be done in a pharmaceutical setting by pharmaceutical companies under the construction of of uh of those sorts of regulatory structures and and uh you know for somebody like me that would be a a, a big mistake on a lot of levels um because i think that it would move the commercial cannabis economy in in the wrong direction and i think it would uh, essentially continue to make um people that are growing plants themselves for their own consumption uh illegal and uh so i the the most the worst outcome would be that we we legalize cannabis but we still continue to arrest people for uh for growing and consuming it that would be a, a real terrible failure and uh so we we definitely need to ensure that as we move forward with national legalization that it's that it's done right in a way that's going to preserve all of the nuance and complexity and and frankly the great things about the illicit cannabis economy that um that we that we could use to improve the way that we create the legal economy because uh there isn't a legal economy in my opinion that is a particularly good model for what the cannabis industry might become uh i think that um, we need to to really reconsider you know like Shalene's talked about in the context of of alcohol and, and tobacco those sorts of frameworks aren't aren't right uh food isn't necessarily right so there's there's a lot of complexity and nuance, and I think if we continue to keep our eye on where we came from and what the uh, positive uh, cultures that existed in the in the illicit cannabis economy and uh, try to cultivate space for that same sort of uh, care economy to exist in, in our uh, new legal markets will be uh, better off than, uh, uh, you know, the alcohol industry and uh, the other things that we often get compared to. Uh, so um, a few specific policies that uh, that we're working on in this vein, uh, one of them is called the, the SHIP Act, which would allow small cannabis producers the ability to send, uh, this would happen after national legalization, uh, their products directly through the mail to any consumer in any legal state. So if a state allowed for um, the importation of cannabis and sales of cannabis into their state, uh, they would necessarily be required to allow uh, small farmers and consumers to have a direct relationship. And uh, the Postal Service would uh, facilitate that on the logistics end. And there are um, ways that the Postal Service can uh, check uh, age verification. They do it already with wine. So they, they check your ID. 
Uh, so I know that's a, a, a first concern for a lot of people when they hear that. Uh, we'll not just be mailing anybody that wants it weed in the mail. Um, and so what that policy would do is it would create a, a an expectation for state regulators that uh, when cannabis is legalized nationally, that this is going to be a part of the cannabis economy. And they can start to, even before national legalization, shape their rules and regulations in a way that is going to anticipate and facilitate the preservation of small production with the direct consumer relationship, because there's invaluable information that is is provided both to the consumer and the producer as a result of that direct human relationship. It's irreplaceable through focus groups or marketing or advertising. Those are the sorts of human scale relationships that existed in, in the illicit cannabis economy that we are starting to lose in the legal cannabis economy and that we should make some after active efforts to uh, expand and preserve. And that's an example of it, the, the consumer uh, producer relationship and 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 making sure that everybody understands uh, the needs and limitations on both sides of that equation and that is um, an important part of shaping an economy and something that regulators and all of us should be keeping in mind um, and then the other policy I mentioned was uh, cannabis as agriculture and what the implications of, of that are is um, if we ensure that when we legalize cannabis nationally, that the production of the cannabis plant is an agricultural activity and it's protected by rights of farm laws, uh, it'll make it so cannabis cultivators uh, are able to be on the same footing with other uh, farmers and other agricultural activities and, and a whole host of, of rules and laws. And um, it will be, a very important part of of making sure that we we end up with a just cannabis economy uh, for the reasons I I mentioned around um, if we if we don't create those protections we will end up in a situation where it could be possible that only corporations with the right licenses are are fundamentally allowed access to the plant and that um, again would be a, pr a pretty big mistake in my mind so um so to summarize i think some of the important components of of the next steps of federal legalization are about uh how do we shape economies what's the values and priorities that goes into making them who's responsible for doing that work who gets access to the decisions uh of what occurs and what are the formal processes to make sure that um you know people like FARA are integral to that development that consumers and patients are integral to that development that doctors and uh other healthcare providers who work with cannabis patients are able to inform that process and uh getting the right federal agencies and the right process in place for that is going to be um the determining factor of whether or not we're successful Thanks so much. Thank you, Micah. Um, I hope everybody found that as compelling as I did. Um, I also want to introduce Kevin Banke next. Kevin is a research assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center at the University of Michigan. His research, his research focuses on the therapeutic applications of illicit or semi-illicit substances like cannabis and psychedelics and helping to address the public health harms caused by their criminalization um, while rigorously assessing the appropriate use of these substances. Um, Dr. Benke will present the benefits of descheduling for res research, patient care, and public health. All right. Thanks so much for that introduction. Can everybody see my slides okay? Um, I think you need to go into full screen mode. How's that? Ah, yes, you're good now. Perfect. All right. Um, well, it is an honor to, to be with y'all tonight. Um, really appreciate the, the um, talks from the previous speakers on policy, business, uh, personal experience on how cannabis criminalization has, has 
affected uh, you know Ferris life and it's just it's truly an honor to be here so I'm I'm gonna I guess compliment some of these things talking about descheduling and rescheduling cannabis and how this may affect um, people who are actually using cannabis medically uh, research and then public health um, just some disclosure. So uh, I've received grant funding from the state of Michigan and the National Institutes of Health to study therapeutic applications of cannabis. Um, received some protocol development funding from Trip Therapeutics to develop a clinical trial protocol for psilocybin and sit uh, in an unpaid capacity on a data safety and monitoring committee uh, for Vario Health, which is a medical cannabis company. So just to start out um, with some definitions, um, when talking about rescheduling versus descheduling, so rescheduling, talking about changing the status of cannabis under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, say from Schedule 1 to 3, while with descheduling, we're talking about removing it from the Controlled Substances Act. Um, this scheduling is based um, on abuse and dependency potential, as well as accepted medical use. So where cannabis is now at Schedule 1 is for drugs, substances, or chemicals, with no currently accepted medical use and a high, high potential of abuse, which obviously makes no sense. Um, other things in Schedule 1 include uh, actually a lot of things that may have some potential medical value is, is demonstrated by some ongoing research, things like uh, MDMA and, uh, and LSD, which are being studied for potential medical usage. Um, and I, I just put this up here as well to show the mismatch between where you see cannabis or marijuana and then um, THC as dronabinol, which is Schedule 3, as well as CBD as Epidiolex, which is actually descheduled as our um, hemp-derived CBD products throughout the country. And so, uh, you know, the, the way that we have things set up now is really challenging, creates this federal versus state uh, mismatch, which, you know, this map showing all the states with legal and adult use cannabis despite the schedule and status, um, has really prevented adequate research from being done. It's hurt patients and it's prevented reasonable public health policy. So this idea that we might be able to reschedule or deschedule cannabis, either I think would be beneficial, but it's worth diving in a little bit more to think about what the implications of either might be um, when considering these groups on the medical side of things. So. Um, I'll just then jump into um, first talking about patients. So um, in a lot of the work that I've done, looking at how people are actually using cannabis medically, um, people need consistent access to safe medicine. They need the products that they rely upon for um, medical purposes as they would any other medication. They need to make sure that that product is safe, so um, that there's safety and potency testing, so they're not consuming a bunch of heavy metals, pesticides, or something that's actually not the, what they were hoping to get in terms of cannabinoid content. Um, and a clear market structure as well, so something that's uh, shown up in Oregon as, as the adult use market um, has showed up uh, and moved gotten more mature, um, there's been numerous reports of, of patients losing access to these types of products that they relied upon. Um, also important for patient needs are the ability to actually integrate it into their current medical care. So this means being able to communicate with their physician and not immediately being kicked to addiction services or losing access to prescriptions because they disclose cannabis use, which still does happen. It also means appropriate education on safety and efficacy, when it's appropriate to use these things, how to avoid side effects, like do you really need to eat that whole brownie depending on how much it has in it, um, and then things like insurance coverage, which we still don't have for any medical cannabis products. Um, and just, uh, I'm going to go a little bit charity and science and, and just pull some statistics out of some uh, publications that I and others have, have put out there. So for example, thinking about how patients select cannabis products rather than going to their physician or healthcare provider, um, which only 2.6% of people in this study did. This is of 1,321 people with chronic pain. Only 2% went to their medical provider versus almost 55 going to a bud tender dispensary employee. And this trend kind of held in the same realm with CBD products among um, over 800 people using CBD 
for fibromyalgia symptoms. Most found those products through personal research, from advice from the employee at the place of purchase, or and with only 16% um, due to the endorsement of a medical professional. So a, a, a clear, um, you know, lack of integration between uh, how people are selecting and using these products. Um, one other thing that has shown up over and over again in the literature as well is some people will move into um, using cannabis because their medications aren't working. So they add cannabis into that treatment regimen and they say, oh, I don't have to use as many opioids or benzodiazepines or NSAIDs or whatever it might be. And so they're doing this substitution. Um, and also in that same 1300 people or so with chronic pain, we showed that this happens uh, you know, in in uh, quite a number of people. So among the 691 people, uh, for example, who said they were using opioids prior to initiating medical cannabis use, uh, almost 70% of them then discontinued fully, um, with many also decreasing uh, and very few say increase in their use of opioids after starting using cannabis. So while these data, you know, are selected among people who likely, because they're all continuing to, to use cannabis, likely biases the data um, in a positive way, there's still clearly a subset of people who are finding this to be helpful. But when we think of whether this is actually integrated with their medical care, which would be useful when thinking about, say, drug-drug interactions or just ensuring that they're doing it in a safe way, when we asked people about how they um, were choosing whether to substitute cannabis for other medications and whether they were influenced, say, by interactions with their healthcare provider or dispensary or their own experiences. You can see um, under experiences that most people here actually just, um, you know, chose to do this substitution based on their own experiences rather than help, uh, communicating with a healthcare provider. And actually many delay having that conversation with their healthcare provider. Um, so there, there's just a pretty serious disconnection there that could that continues to harm um, patients because of this um, lack of clarity around the way cannabis is being dealt with. Either descheduling or rescheduling would probably help with any of these issues. Um, but it, you know, well, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that when I get to the end, but I, I think that, that either of those would be a huge boon for your patients. On the research side of things, um, there's actually some similarities there. Obviously, consistent access to safe and representative cannabis products, so we can actually study what they do. So I live in Michigan. We have legal adult and medical cannabis. Um, I can go into a dispensary as an adult and buy whatever I want. I cannot do that as a scientist and study those in clinical trials or any kind of, of work that I might want to do. Um, and so that makes it really challenging to uh, you know, understand what the effects of these products might be and how to optimize people's use. And also there's a huge number, a huge number of emerging cannabis products that scientifically we know basically nothing about. There's synthetic products, there's minor cannabinoids. Uh, like CBG, CBC, uh, over 100 others um, that probably will become more widely available as time goes on. Um, so understanding what's happening with, their, with those, whether they might be helpful, as well as thinking about things like safety is incredibly important. Um, uh, we need legal clarity as well um, and reduced barriers to research to help maximize benefit and minimize risk associated with these products. So, um, you know, of course, the Schedule One status, not only does that mean that it's challenging, there's stigma for patients, there's uh, the criminalization, which of course has huge public health consequences, but it also means that it's more difficult to study any of these things on the research side of things. Um, and so just to give you an example of um, what this looks like in terms of this, you know, just at the basic level, what we've studied in clinical trials scientifically versus what is available in dispensaries. So there are those products that I highlighted in that first slide. There's Marinol or Dronabinol, which is synthetic THC made in the lab at Schedule 3. Um, there's Sativex, which is a one-to-one -one sublingual THC to CBD. Um, uh, yeah, one-to-one -one CBD to THC ratio uh, sublingual sprayer. That's actually not available in the US, but is in a few dozen other countries. There's Epidiolex, which is a CBD solution. And then um, 
there's cannabis grown um, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse funded site uh, at the University of Mississippi. There are now several other sites as well, um, but that's what was used for the, the vast majority uh, of the past 40 or so years of medical cannabis research. Well, of course, on the medical cannabis product side of things, you can get gummies, you know, concentrates, high quality flour, um, edibles, juices, lotions, all kinds of stuff, uh, none of which has typically been tested, nor have the combinations of them typically been tested. So um, people typically use a lot of these products together and then end up, uh, but it's challenging to study how, you know, people use those things in combination um, in clinical trials. So it simply hasn't been done as well because of the legal um, issues and side of things. So getting into public health, uh, we need consistent standards for cannabis products when it comes to labeling, production, and tracking, consideration of these emerging cannabinoids. Um, there's this proposal for an uh, uh, international intoxicating cannabinoid product symbol, which would be a very clear visual indicator that could go on any product, say, with THC, so people can see that. We also need some legal clarity of who would actually regulate this. Um, will it be the FDA? That'd probably happen if um, it potentially happen. Uh, there's, I don't want to say probably because this could go in any number of ways, but if it was rescheduled, say, from one to two or one to three, um, it's possible it'd stay under the, the bounds of the FDA. If it's descheduled, it could, you know, go to um, a, a number of different places, perhaps the, perhaps the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. And who is regulating that could have a lot of effects and, and greatly influence how cannabis is then dealt with and, and looked at on the policy side of things. And that, of course, will affect public health. And then lastly, as, as we've heard um, already tonight, just probably the most important public health needs is to avoid further harm and address damage done by the war on drugs. Um, thinking about things like uh, depression, anxiety, trauma-related symptoms, which uh, Fair Artists talked so eloquently about tonight, loss of income, family ties, and voting disenfranchisement. Um, and all of this also, you know, on the background of a, a, you know, there's still hundreds of thousands of arrests for cannabis each year. And this is in, in the face too, as well, of a huge increase of, you know, the growing number of people with medical cannabis licenses. So about 680,000 in 2016 to almost 3 million in 2020. So um, with all of these things together, I mean, obviously either scheduling or descheduling would be beneficial. They're, they would both result in reduced barriers to research um, and benefit patient care and public health. Uh, honestly, I favor descheduling at this point because it would better align with existing market structures, allow for easier research, um, provide legal clarity to help patients and healthcare providers. And I think perhaps most importantly, it would stop the continued criminalization of people using cannabis um, and ideally incorporate many of those policy suggestions that we heard previously. Um, so I'll just close. This is something that I think a lot about when it comes to cannabis being used medically, um, pulling from an article written by David Nutt, who talks about N equals one trials, which basically when somebody takes their own medication um, and sees if it works for them or not, it, this is an experiment and it's also the core of medical practice. Um, in some people that works and in some people it fails. And I think we should just apply this same philosophy to cannabis policy. We know that what we have right now is not working. We've heard some really wonderful ideas right now uh, in, in this webinar about what we can try and experiment with. And let's do something different to uh, try to make sure that this space is crafted in a, a thoughtful way that protects patients, public health, um, and just society in general. So with that, thank you so much for your kind attention. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Can we just give a little virtual <laughs> round of applause? Um, really just for, for all of our speakers today, I, I, your life's work is something that um, society will be better for. So 
thank you so much for for just being here. Um, during the time of this webinar, we have been monitoring the chat, and I want to encourage uh, those of us who are um, participants on the call. Uh, there's still time to get your questions in and your comments. Um, so we have been pulling together some questions. I will be kind of fielding those questions and asking them back out to the speakers. Uh, the first one is actually for uh, Farah. And so Farah, so many people um, just, my, and myself included, wanted to thank you for your vulnerability and being willing to even touch on trauma that you experienced. It is um, such a hard thing to do, but you're choosing to use your story um, to, to help us move forward. Uh, and that's a very noble thing. So thank you. Um, both myself and Brian um, were very curious. You know, we heard so much about your story. Can we hear a little bit more about your current work um, and about some of the work that was sent out um, before this webinar about your work with mothers using cannabis? Yeah, so um, I want to say in 2017, I wrote for um, an article for Push Magazine. Unfortunately, the publication, I think, just went under, but um, it was the first time actually me sharing my story um, about just using using cannabis while pregnant and how I still use it like during my parenting. Um, and what I thought was going to be like extreme backlash, I actually just got like, like just a flood of um, emails and DMs um, at the time from like mothers who actually did use or wanted to use and had so many questions. Um, so with that work, I just wanted to start um, pretty much highlighting other women's stories to kind of make sure that we kind of, you know, we weren't alone. Um, there are many women, um, there are many parents who use cannabis to help them kind of cope through just different things that, can, um, that pregnancy can bring, which is just like nausea, back pain, um, you know, loss of appetite, uh, which was something I was experiencing. Um, and just all around stress of um, parenting. And I've hosted um, workshops. I've interviewed so many women. Um, and I want to still continue to help women on their cannabis journey to kind of end the stigma. Um, my participation, um, my fellowship now with like Just Leadership uh, hopefully can help me expand um, my voice and activism um, because I think just it's just a necessary conversation to have um, we do have a question for Shalene. Um, and so the question for Shalene is, what part of private prison models have added to this problem throughout the years and now? Uh, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think um, there's obviously an incentive uh, with private prisons to keep making profit and to keep incarcerating people. And I think that has made um, that has made two problems. So one is that it's an incentive to keep prohibition going as long as possible. But the second problem that I think we're seeing more of right now is the incentive to crack down on the illicit market. And in that case, we are in the worst case scenario, just displacing the market um, to large, wealthy, well-resourced, white-owned corpor corporations, and then continuing to incarcerate everyone else. And so the way that we stop that is, of course, by making sure that the market structure is fair and that we are watching um, who prohibition and post-prohibition, um, the criminal laws are being enforced against. And if we continue to see disparities, which in most cases we are, um, that we refuse to, to let that continue. Mm. Thank you for shedding, shedding a light on that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. So the next question is for Micah. Um, what regulatory precedents exist that could serve as a foundation for mandating CME training in tandem with legalization um, to reduce patient provider stigma and to kind of ensure, okay, <laughs> see this well, sure the healthcare providers have a better understanding um, of how cannabis works in the body. Um, 
Well, I don't think uh, CME training is necessarily my uh, expertise, but uh, I definitely think that um, there's a ton of opportunity for for medical professionals to get educated on uh, you know on how cannabinoids work. Um, I just from my personal experience, we have about four or five um, MDs that prescribe cannabis to their patients that reach out to us on a on a variety of things. And um, as far as like regulatory precedents, I, I I don't have an answer to that, but um, I do know that there is an is an awful lot of opportunity to. Um, as I think Kevin's last slide said to, uh, you know, take the the anecdotal and experiential evidence that we that we have from thousands and millions of people that uh, consume cannabis for lots of ailments and to, and to take that information and and get it into a way that uh, medical professionals can um, can make sense of in the context of their practice and, uh, you know, build on that. So there's, you know, I guess anecdotal evidence is is uh, still evidence, and and there's there's an awful lot of it out there that we could be working on. Hmm. Thank you. Um, any of the speakers, feel free to to weigh in before I go on to the next question. If if you have something to say on that point. Yeah, I, I guess I would think both CMEs, but also like an actual incorporation into medical school curriculum and and the curriculum of, of emerging healthcare professionals. So I think there's a paper published in 2016 or 2017 that showed that only 9% of medical schools have any kind of medical cannabis related curricula at all. Um, so what that means is, you know, these people who are going to be on the front lines working with people using cannabis, be it for medical or adult use purposes, they just don't get any training on it. Um, so that, that would be another place that I'd like to see a more formal uh, incorporation of this into, um, into to medical training. Yeah, that's certainly interesting. I know that um, one of the team members who uh, we have is an administrator here today, uh, actually went to Harvard for a, a master's in bioethics and she's going back to medical school. And so, you know, I'm just going to call her out. Deandra, you got to, you got to take this charge with you when you go back uh, in the fall. <laughs> um, okay. I, will. Um, I guess I can shed a little bit for myself too, from my perspective, um, having been at Harvard Medical School and discussing from the ethics side, I think just what we've all shared here today, I agree that particularly in medical schools, there needs to be more of a push for the curriculum to see how we can support um, the populations that are most affected, i.e. Black and Brown communities. Um, and there's not enough of that in medical school curricula now. So I would echo um, what Dr. Banky said. And I think we have a Leslie in the chat also um, is saying that they are uh, engaged in a research study um, on the medical school curriculum. So let's get some good synergies going there. Um, I have another question, uh, particularly for Kevin. Um, so Andrea from the chat says, uh, I've seen tracking for market um, ingestion method preferences, but not tracking for CBD versus THC products, um, both in terms of usage and production or availability. Do you know of anyone who is tracking this data? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked if there, there were some like um, industry groups doing it for their own products, but in terms of like what I've seen reported at the statewide level and some of the studies that I do like compile all of the you know, the public reports that are put out by each state with a medical cannabis or adult use cannabis program, I haven't seen these data reported. Um, and I, I hope that's something that comes out soon, but that's that's a huge data quality issue that I've, I've seen, on, especially on the medical cannabis side of things, where it's, you know, if people are using a medical product, they should know what what they're getting and ideally we should have a sense of that too on a societal level um 
I mean, we do that with, say, pre prescription drug monitoring programs. That's very common to do with any kind of controlled substance. So um, it's, it's a place that federal action could be really important in crafting something that would allow us to, as Mike was saying, gather some really high quality real world evidence and have that be baked into this um, federal legalization program. Because if we had, say, a patient registry or something like that, um, especially if it was not criminalized, that would be a wonderful resource that um, scientists could use to be like, oh, okay, we noticed that the 600,000 people using cannabis for rheumatoid arthritis or something like this is the sort of, you know, uh, cannabinoid content and groups of administration and all that sort of stuff that they're using. Now let's skillfully design some clinical trials or that sort of thing to to really you know, figure that out in, in a really thoughtful way. Um, but we, you know, in, until we get that in place, it's just going to be hard to, to do that in the same way. But yeah, I would love to see that. Um, um, thank you. So we have uh, another question, um, particularly for Micah, but um, all, all of our esteemed presenters, please feel free to weigh in. So Micah, the question is, um, here in Pennsylvania, where the person is, um, regulated CBD access is poor in part because hemp farmers and producers don't have direct access to the legal cannabis market. Um, I know Oregon allows hemp within the cannabis market as long as it adheres to testing and labeling standards. Has that worked and what challenges have there been? Um, I don't know about Oregon. I'm in Washington and Washington does allow, um, tested CBD to be brought in from hemp into our adult use cannabis market to be used as an ingredient in, uh, in products to increase the CBD level. It's like written very specifically. Um, and, um, that has worked fairly well as far as, um, getting, uh, more CBD at a, at a less expensive price into the adult use market um for people to manufacture products from um I, and i'm just going to kind of take this into a, a slightly different direction um you know cannabis is is the is this plant that's both hemp and and the sort of drug cultivars that we cultivate in the adult use space and um our goal is is, is really to get to a place where uh there isn't a distinction between cannabis that's grown for cannabinoids based on um you know the the cannabinoid content and that all cannabis that's produced for for human consumption for cannabinoids is is grown in sort of one regulated environment that then sort of differentiates in how these products are manufactured about whether or not they're intoxicating or not so the the sort of hemp cannabis divide uh I, you know i hope is something that we uh, are able to 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 get beyond and, and and get to this sort of one plant one system that's often referred to uh and then just to chime in on the on the question before as well. Uh, I have about 65% of the production that I have in uh, mixed ratio CBD and THC strains. Um, and there's definitely a huge underserved market for those types of products uh, in, in all of the markets, adult use, as well as medical. And uh, so that's definitely something that I think we've, we've only seen like uh, the sort of very beginnings of, um, you know, there hasn't been nearly as much research into breeding and cultivating particular plants for those properties. And uh, so there's, and those are definitely the, the, the sorts of um, cultivars that we hear the most um, feedback from people that are looking to treat ailments that they find relief from. Uh, so definitely that um, fuller spectrum, um, you know, what we call type two strains, which are strains that are, are uh, genetically uh, um, similar in a way that they produce mixed ratios of THC and CBD. And those are the, um, you know, if you remember back to your biology uh, classes with the, the four squares, those are the ABs and the Vs, A's. And the, and the high THC cultivars are the AAs and the high CBD cultivars are the, are the BVs. So the, the, those mixed ratio things are, are probably the things that we've been cultivating for thousands and thousands of years or, or something like them. And a lot of these uh, high THC varieties are, are really like uh, 
intentionally cultivated uh, for that. And so there is, I think, a long history of, of us using those mixed ratio strains and, and uh, bringing those back into our uh, more regular consumption. And there, there's ways to consume those where they don't have any intoxicating effects, if that's what you're looking for. And uh, so there's a whole host of things we could do with all of the, uh, with the cannabis plant that, that are, are, are above and beyond what we've done thus far. Wow. I am over here uh, taking notes because you were saying ABs and BAs and charts and graphs. I was trying to follow, but <laughs> um, we actually have a question for Shalene. Um, Shalene, have any of uh, the challenges I think that you mentioned, have they been appealed and worked their way through the courts? Um, and the person said, I can see the Supreme Court shutting down these social equity programs um, as they're likely to do for college admissions. So. Great question. Um, so uh, no, not yet in general. Um, the challenges that I mentioned in Massachusetts didn't even make it to a court decision because it was really clear they were going to lose and they were being boycotted. So the lawsuits were dropped. Um, but there is an instance in here in the First Circuit where um, in Maine, essentially, uh, residency requirements were ruled unconstitutional for the medical market. If we see a different decision in a different circuit, we could have a circuit split, which means that could go to the Supreme Court potentially. And I would say that is the most likely question because it's to, to reach there because it's a really confusing question of can we have states that are banning um, out of state products and companies and discriminating against out-of-state businesses, which you typically can't do uh, with a federally illegal product. Um, and that is such an important question because if those barriers come down, people can start shipping across states and everything is going to look completely different. But with regards to like, I think you were referring to affirmative action, um, I don't really see a big risk there because you don't see quotas anymore. We just had that first one in Ohio that I mentioned, but otherwise states are very careful. Like for example, in Massachusetts, you can qualify for a social equity or similar program if you are black or Latino, but that's one, uh, one criteria. You have to meet three out of six. And so you can be any race and you can still um, qualify for the program. So I have yet to see that be a problem. Um, and I do want to flag one more thing, which is that um, if these are evidence-based policies, which they should be, they are typically going to be Black, um, Latin, and Indigenous people that we're talking about specifically, and not just people of color or minorities. We actually did Massachusetts um, research uh, from the regulating agency that actually showed Asians are less likely than white people to be disproportionately impacted by the drug war. And so we definitely do not, for both moral and legal reasons, want to have Asian people who are benefiting from an equity-like program. So um, the key point there is we want to avoid racial quotas that are arbitrary, and we want to have evidence-based programs that are very clearly related to both the business data that we have, communities that are being shut out, and the drug war data that we have. Mm. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, um, and and Maureen um, from from the chat made a comment um, and said that um, Maureen had heard that the BIPOC male uh, between ages eighteen to twenty one are the fastest growing population of new arrests, um, and so just brought that to our attention in the chat. Um, wow. So very, very weighty, weighty stuff here. I want to, um, I want to thank all of you for, um, your life's work, for your research, um, for choosing to share that with us today. Um, 
I want to thank the Parabola Center uh, for their partnership in delivering this webinar. Um, I want to say something really quickly about the importance of uh, supporting this work, um, research and activism and thought leadership um, and people who are working on the front lines to kind of shape the future of our society. And uh, so want to also invite you all to uh, donate to both the Parabola Center and um, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. Without those donations, you know, we, we can't deliver work like this um, and hold spaces like this. So we hope that you will, um, you know, take the opportunity to, to donate where you can. And so again, we want to thank you so much. Thank you to each of our speakers and presenters uh, for their time. And most importantly, thank you all for joining us.